the Vietnam War and the push for US involvement was a result of the Gulf of Tonkin incident. A lie. The Iraq War famously is a result of lies. Wars in Somalia are a result of lies. The Second World War and the German invasion of Poland was a result of carefully constructed lies. That is war by media. Let us ask ourselves of the complicit media, which is the majority of the mainstream press, what is the average death count attributed to each journalist? This is Randy Critico, live on the fly, Assange Countdown to Freedom, episode 39. We have a special show um, today. This is um, on the French Revolution and journalists of the French Revolution, hunted journalists, one in particular, Jean-Paul Marat, uh, who is a fascinating character. And it fits in with our Assange theme here uh, because uh, Assange is persecuted. He's telling the truth. That's exactly what Marat did. They tried to kill him. They finally did kill him. Uh, they persecuted him. They put him on trial. They tried to hunt him down, hiding here and there. And we're going to talk to the author of this book called uh, John Paul Marat. And uh, it's about time. I've been wanting to do this for a long period of time. I read this book like 20 years ago, and uh, I just got a new copy of it. And we're going to have the author of the book, uh, who only two books on Marat in English, and one was 100 years ago, and then you have this one, and there's a new edition of it. I'm um, being joined by Kelly Lane down in, in North Carolina, who is the engineer and editor and uh, all sorts of things. It's very busy down there. And um, I'm here uh, somewhere upstate. And uh, so uh, let's just get right into it. Let's, like, I'm going to play for you a little scene from that sets up the uh, the interview. This is the La Marseillaise. Now you know the La Marseillaise. This is from Casablanca. It's that famous scene when Paul Henry gets everybody all worked up to sing it uh, in the middle of the German singing. I think the horse vessel or some some Nazi uh, war song. Uh, and we'll be right back uh, with. Um, my good friend Cliff Connor. Play La Marseillaise. Play it. Frenchmen and women inside Rick's joint in Casablanca singing uh, La Marseillaise. Uh, I'm Randy Critical. This is Randy Critical Live on the Fly, Assange Countdown to Freedom. I think it's episode 39. I'm beginning to lose count. And today, uh, we're going to, as I said in the opening, uh, we are um, going to be uh, talking with uh, Cliff Connor, who's an author, historian, 
uh, really specializes, I think, in the, that era of the French Revolution, which is one of my favorite topics of all time, is the French Revolution, that in the Paris Commune, and a lot of American history, but I love uh, the French Revolution. And this book I have right here, you see? There it is, I got it yesterday. That's, that's, uh, that's the short version of the long book that I read years ago that Bill Shap gave me, who uh, is the former editor, the late uh, founder of Covert Action and Lies of Our Times, uh, a great guy. And Cliff, I gotta tell you, I love this book, okay? Thank I you. love this book. Uh, before I talk about it, the, the, I just played uh, Paul Henry leading the, uh, you know, the counter demonstration inside Rick's joint singing uh, La Marseillaise, right? He says, right. Bogart lets him play it. But I love the film. It's one of my favorite movies of all time, but I've always had a problem with the fact that they're sitting there, the French, you know, they're being occupied by the Germans, even though the French were occupying Morocco at the same time, right? Yes. So it's a contradiction that never comes through in that movie. There are a lot of contradictions, and it, most of them probably go back to the French Revolution that we're going to be talking about. Yes. We, okay. Well, we're going to talk about the French Revolution, and um, I, I just what what uh, fascinated you because you're one of only two historians uh, in, in English that have written about Marat. Uh, this Jean-Paul Marat, by the way, is is the book. All right. Right. And it's a fascinating book. Uh, and it's if you like the French Revolution, this is the character that I think is most responsible for it. The same way Tom Paine was most responsible for the American Revolution, even though he got screwed in the end. Well, uh, you can certainly make a case for that, and I try to make that case. Although I, I rate, uh, well, the thing is, you're talking about the other uh, biographers, the one that, the only other one in English that's available was written in 1927, so it's yes. pretty old. But the problem isn't that it's out of date. At that time, it was, I think, uh, in evaluating Marat, just wrong. And that's why I, I wanted to write th this biography. But I was blown away by the fact that you look at the New York Times book review and you can see biographies of hundreds of people that nobody's ever heard of, which is not a bad thing. I'm all for writing biographies of little known figures. But Murat is one of the most important historical figures in the history of the world. In the because, world, not just France, but in the world. Absolutely, because uh, in world history, the French Revolution was a, a turning point. It was a major event. And here's this guy who was, I think, number two in importance. I think the most important figure in that revolution was uh, Robespierre. And one reason you can tell that is because when Marat was assassinated, the revolution kept pro progressing. Uh, but when Robespierre was killed, it basically came to a halt. It didn't get rolled back to the beginning. It didn't get all the, the great achievements of the French Revolution weren't wiped out, but it just stopped right at that point and didn't, and the moderates re, re, uh, you know, got control back over the society. And that's where all the, uh, uh, contradictions you were talking about earlier come in because it was a revolution, a radical revolution, uh, and then it, it suddenly stopped with the death of Robespierre and, uh, and became very moderate and then Napoleon Bonaparte took over and you know the rest is history as they say. So you have a what was much more radical. L let me give you a little framework here. Uh, the historians you read, in English especially, will tell you that Marat was not important at all. And in fact, that other biography by Louis Gottschalk, the 1927 one, his, his thesis was Marat was an interesting guy, but he was just a lot of noise. He was just a, a demagogue. He just made, uh, he, he uh, incited violence and uh, he wasn't important. That's that was it was a lot of uh, sound and fury signifying nothing, as Shakespeare said. But I, I I don't think that's true. 
And that's why I wrote this, uh, my version of Marat's life to show that he was a very important leader of that revolution. And I, I even argue that the revolution would not have been able to consolidate the gains that it did make if he hadn't been on the scene. Well, can I make a comparison? You know, uh, the fact that he was persecuted and he was pursued, which we'll get into in a few minutes, so vigorously, uh, particularly in 1789, 1790, uh, you know, the fact that he was, they were after him uh, and they supposedly had a free speech at that time. And they were they closed down his press a number to, a number of times. <laughs> this is what happens. You see, the fact that they did that means that he was important. The same way Elijah Lovejoy was so important uh, during the abolition movement that they had to destroy his press and kill him. And the same way Julian Assange right now, they're yeah. trying to quiet him up because of what he does is so significant, exposing the crimes of state, uh, the corruption of state. Uh, and so that's why the book definitely, and I've read this a couple of times, makes it quite clear. You make the case for him. He couldn't have had a better brief than this book. Uh, and I urge people to try to get that. Uh, and you'll tell us at the end of the show how people can access uh, this great book. Now, uh, they also, which really I, I didn't realize until I read the, um, the, the forward, uh, that they you know, the, the, re, the uh, revi <laughs> revisionism that was so stark uh, in, in the 50s, in the Cold War era, uh, they would hammer Murat as being this, like, uh, into totalitarianism, yeah. uh, inciting violence. Uh, why did they do that? Well, it didn't start in the 50s. What happened was, at the time of Murat's death, he was one of the great heroes of France. People, there was a, uh, his um, funeral procession after his assassination was like six hours long. Uh, every, it seemed like everybody in Paris and half the people from the provinces came in to celebrate Marat and uh, mourn his, his assassination. But then when Robespierre was killed a year later, uh, then things began to go backwards, and it went into the period called Thermidor, which was the right-wing uh, uh, counter-revolution. Basically, as I said, it didn't reverse the gains of the French Revolution back to zero, but it turned things back uh, a certain degree, and it made uh, everything moderate. First of all, I should say, you said something earlier about the oppressed people against the oppressors. And that's the way people usually look at a revolution. And uh, it's true, it's a good way to understand it, oppressors versus oppressed. But if you look closer, you see that among the oppressed that are fighting the oppressors, there are often divisions. And there are often some people better off than others. So on Bastille Day in 1789, there was a massive uprising against the monarchy. And it actually, won a huge gain in transforming what had been an absolutist monarchy, which had no restraints on it at all, into a constitutional monarchy. So that was a big gain. It was like a civil rights movement here. It was very important, although uh, we've seen that it didn't answer all the questions of, for uh, African Americans. Uh, the same, same is true. Uh, so you have 1789, was the first part of the revolution, which was a good thing. But there were other people like Marat and Robespierre that wanted to go farther. And right. they achieved that in 1793. Well, so, let's go back for a minute. I want to go back because you're right about Marat uh, going back to 1789. He doesn't even have a printing press at this point. He doesn't until, um, until August. He's trying to get someone to finance him. I mean, he's written... He's written uh, pamphlets in, in London uh, where yeah. he was, and he was chased there on some bogus uh, theft charge at uh, Oxford Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, you proved that he definitely, you exculpated him in, in the book. You found some information that was new. Uh, yeah. So he, he had written some, but he really got into this moment. 
And so he started writing in, in uh, you know, his own, uh, his own printing press. He couldn't get financing. Somehow he was paying heavy interest uh, to print somewhere else. Uh, but at first he was kind of a moderate. I mean, he supported, yeah. he supported the, the monarchy uh, for whatever reason. He supported the monarchy and he supported Lafayette at that particular period of time, if you recall. Right. Uh, so now, now, of course, now we go into October, though. Tell us about October uh, of that year that transformed morale. Okay, well, uh, October was, uh, he, he'd become, he, everything you said is correct. And he'd become more and more radical as time goes by. He was hoping that the king would do the right thing. That's what everybody hoped, because they didn't, they didn't understand that you could have a re republic in a country that size. The United States was the first one to try it, and it really hadn't come along enough to prove that it could work in France. So he thought you had to have a decider, and the king would be a good decider if he would do the right thing but it became clear he wasn't going to do the right thing. And so as that became clearer and clearer, he and other people around him radicalized more. So in October, uh, the king moved to, uh, well, I don't know exactly when it was, but before October, uh, the king had moved his palace from Paris. He moved his household from Paris to Versailles, which is about 20 miles away. Uh, if you've ever been to Paris, or if anybody listening has, and you've gone to the Louvre Museum, that was the royal palace that they left and went to Versailles. So uh, Marat and other people thought, uh-oh, this is not good. They're plotting to try to get away from Paris because of the radical people like ourselves that want them to do the right thing. We go out in the street and make demands, and they don't want to be threatened, so they move to Versailles. So what happened was uh, a more or less uh, spontaneous movement developed. It wasn't totally spontaneous because Marat was, had begun publishing his uh, L'Ami du Peuple, which was his newspaper. And he was demanding that the king come back. We gotta, the king can't be in Versailles. He'll be out of our reach. We got to bring him back. So a major March began, I can't remember the date, uh, say October 10th, I think it might have been, where lots and lots and lots and lots of lower class Parisian women began marching toward Versailles. And a lot of men joined them. And then the Parisian National Guard, which had been formed as an, uh, a counterweight to the Royal Army, began following as well. And you know who was in charge of the Parisian National Guard was Lafayette. And what you have to know about Lafayette, he was supposed to be a great hero. They called him the hero of two worlds because of his role in the American Revolution. And then uh, he was a hero to the people for that in Paris. So they elected him to be the head of the National Guard. So here are these women followed by uh, uh, a lot of men, 20,000 of them, I think it was, marching toward Versailles, 20 miles, that's a long march. Yeah. So, uh, and their idea was they're gonna confront the royal army that's uh, surrounding uh, the king's residence in Versailles, the Versailles Palace. So as these women and men set out, then the National Guard follows them and walks a little faster to get in the front and this is uh, uh, Lafayette. He didn't lead the thing, but he got in front of it so he could say later that he led it. <laughs> but he was pushed into this. So they get to the Versailles. Uh, the, uh, a lot of the uh, soldiers in the Royal Army are not real happy about what they're doing. In fact, they're confined to their barracks. So the, the movement, the march, that surrounded uh, the king's palace in Versailles, forced him and his family to return to Paris and live in the Tuileries, uh, which is now the Louvre Museum. So that was successful, and that was a big radical uh, movement. But after that, to tell you the truth, 
there was about a year and a half of social peace. They, uh, once they got the king back, the king was pretending to be all in favor of uh, uh, constitutional monarchy, uh, but we know from his correspondence it was discovered later he wasn't. And by the way, the other great hero of that moment was Mirabeau, and he died around that time. Uh, and the Parisian masses treated him as a great hero. Oh, our wonderful revolutionary savior. And Marat said, you're crazy. You're fools. If you think that Marat, I mean, if you think that Mirabeau was your, your savior, he was betraying you. And right. Marat knew this, but he didn't have the goods. And so a lot of people didn't believe him. Later, when the correspondence of the king came out, and they found out that Mirabeau was on the king's payroll, as, and his job was to keep the revolution from getting any more radical, well, then people realized that Marat had been right all along. And that was part of the whole thing that, that built Marat's reputation. He was always a step ahead of the consciousness of the masses. They were thinking Mirabeau and Lafayette were their heroes. And Marat by then was just telling them, no, you cannot trust Lafayette. You cannot trust Mirabeau. At first, and wait, see, at first he him. did, though, right? Huh? At, at first he did trust him. Right, he was arrested okay. earlier. Right, right. He was arrested by him. Uh, they did have a um, some kind of uh, a tribunal, uh, and he cut him loose. And they had this conversation, according to him, although it's not in uh, Lafayette's biography, uh, autobiography. But uh, he did meet with Lafayette, and he did like put the pressure on him by saying, "You're a great man, and you should be a great man here." And he laid off of him and turned all of his vector on Necker, the finance minister. Right. Yeah, well, I think that was uh, tactically the right thing for Marat to do. He didn't need at that point to alienate uh, the leader of, of the National Guard that the masses trusted. Meanwhile, in his newspaper, he was explaining, uh, you know, uh, okay, uh, keep an eye on Lafayette. <laughs> Yeah, which perfect. was the right tactic at that time, I think. I found, through a, a, as you get into the book, you'll see that I find, I try not to, to praise Marat to the skies because it's not my, uh, I, I don't like hero worship or anything like that. But I just thought he was a very principled revolutionary leader. And I, I kind of bring that out in terms of the tactics that he used. He, he seemed to always know what to do next. So I admire him as a revolutionary leader. I don't want to lionize him and call him, um, you know, a, a hero or anything like that. He made some very revolutionary statements. Now, after the um, the march uh, to Versailles, and there were a couple of casualties, uh, some of his uh, fellow journalists, like Brousseau, uh, said that this was way over the top. Uh, he took full credit for it, even though Desmoline was also involved in inspiring that march. Uh, but he and you make a case why he should take full credit. Uh, but um, you know he defended himself on that. And actually, I got a statement that that you you, you got you have in the book that he made. This part of it: uh, the people only rise up and revolt when they are pushed to the point of despair by tyranny. That's what he said. And so he had no apologies for leading that march or inspiring that march. Uh, to get 20,000 people to go from Paris all the way to Versailles. Yeah, and, uh, and back down the Royal Army there too. <laughs> yeah, right, so, but they, they, they were successful. And, but, you know, he continued to be persecuted, even though the laws at the time, uh, they were afraid of this guy. They were afraid Absolutely. of his pen. He was that powerful. Absolutely. Well, uh, you mentioned the 1950s and the revisionist historians that began to pound Marat again. The reason they did that is because from the 1930s uh, in France, the historians of the revolution were Marxists. And that was uh, kind of a strange thing because, uh, you know, Marx said that the ideology of any period is, uh, is tied to the ruling ideas. And the ruling ideas weren't Marxist. But in this section of the universities where uh, dealing with the history of the French Revolution in France, uh, it was Marxists like George Lefebvre that you mentioned earlier. Right. Uh, and, and so he had written about 
uh, the coming revolution in 1788, I believe. There's a pamphlet that that uh, he wrote, and and Very I know important book. And that, and that and of course, you know, the seeds of that revolution. There was a famine. Uh, I'm not sure if it's in your book, but I know there was a famine, uh, and the price of uh, bread went like through the roof. Right. And, there was no way to raise any money. Uh, they had already taxed to death uh, the, the third estate. Um, you know, the peasants. They, yeah, they had already. There was no. They, they had. They had gone bankrupt supporting the U.S. the American Revolution, and they didn't have any cash. Exactly. And they were in this lavish lifestyle, and uh, that's why they brought this guy Necker in to try to figure it out. And um, so. That's 178, that's the sea. Just like there was hunger and there was despair in Cuba, which helped lead to the revolution, same thing in Russia. And, the, and you have to have causes like this for a revolution to be ripe. Uh, right. I mean, historically. Right. Would it be in Haiti uh, with uh, Toussaint Louverture? I mean, you know, they had slavery. Uh, so these revolts always seen revolutions, Sandinistas, you know, 80% were illiterate and, uh, and living in uh, such squalor and uh, no medical care. Uh, people were dying left and right. Uh, and so that's what led to this uh, calling of the third, the, uh, of the uh, estates general. Right. I had to go back to that because that preceded uh, what happened on July 14, 1789, was the, the estates general. And it was run by Mirabeau, who you have said, Correct. See, work, and he did not trust him. You go, you go later on. He didn't trust the National Assembly at all because they were, you know, these a lot of these people were upper class. Exactly. Right? Yeah. The assembly, and he knew they were throwing bones uh, a little bit here, a little bit there, but not enough to satisfy the needs of the public. And so he wrote against that, and right? It, and it infuriated people. So he goes back to England. And he's in disguise again. I mean, he had to, he was living sub rosa like the Scarlet Pimpermill in <laughs> real life for like for three years, right? Uh, yes, exactly. He was underground. He had to hide his presses. Uh, he had a, a remarkable uh, network of of uh, underground print shops that uh, people would print these things for him. He had his own presses for a while. Over those three years, things would get better and they'd get worse and they'd get better and they'd get worse. So he'd be able to come out and be in semi-clandestinity from time to time. But then the cops would come again. He'd always get away from them. The reason he always got away from them is because he had informants everywhere. He had them in the royal palace. He had informants in the, in the police, in the so-called revolutionary police, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, the ones that were trying to arrest him and, and shut him up, even though they claimed to have free speech. Uh, but he, he was considered so dangerous. And the amazing thing is that after he died, after his assassination, a year later, when the Thermidorian period came along, he was still so feared, his ideas, his legacy, the revolutionary legacy of Marat was so feared that from that point on, uh, all throughout the, the, the 19th century, it was virtually illegal to publish anything positive about Marat. Uh, one guy tried to, uh, in, uh, I think it was in the 1840s, tried to uh, publish Marat's writings, and they put him in jail. Another guy named Alfred Bougeard wrote a biography of Marat that was positive. Uh, and called him a revolutionary hero. They put him in jail for that. Uh, it was illegal. That's how bad it was. That's how much they feared him. This is a hundred years after his death, almost. <laughs> well, the same thing is true with uh, with Thomas Paine. Uh, they've suppressed everything that he stood for. He was uh, an abolitionist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we celebrate all of these other clowns. You know, Washington and Jefferson. Hamilton. <laughs> I mean, it, I get sick thinking of Hamilton. <laughs> well, I love the show, but I mean, you know. I'm not even going to see the show. Yeah, I'm actually an Aaron Burr fan, much more than Hamilton. Oh. I read well, a great You can see it for seven bucks now, by the way, on huh? TV. You can see Hamilton for seven bucks on I'll TV. Pass on that. I'm not going to perpetuate revisionism because <laughs> I know what a scoundrel he was, all right? 
Yeah. Uh, but those are the people that we all lionize, uh, particularly on the 4th of July. Uh, and Payne, who comes into the French Revolution, I don't, I don't know if he met Marat, probably did, but Payne, yeah, he did. who was really the, the brain, the brains of the, without him, Washington would have, you know, his guns would have been in vain without the pen of Thomas Paine. But like I said, once he was gone, once they, they kind of neutralized his memory, uh, and you have all the way up to Teddy Roosevelt slamming Thomas Paine. You know, ironically, you know who's saying nice things about him right now is Rudy Giuliani. Uh, he's got a show called, a podcast called Common Sense, and he's oh, using oh. Paine. Can you believe that? He does like a two minute uh, um, uh, cold opening with, uh, with Thomas Paine and uh, his ideals as if he has anything in common with right. Thomas Paine. That, that's just uh, more Giuliani's tricksterism, you know. It's, uh, but I wanted to say one thing uh, I forgot to say earlier. Uh, let me back up and congratulate you on your efforts on behalf of Julian Assange. I went back and looked at uh, some of your other uh, interviews in this series. And speaking of Thomas Paine, I uh, thought that uh, I'm really honored to be on uh, a series where Harvey Kay was on and uh, Stephen Kinzer. Uh, so the thank you for great guest, Afshin Ratanzi, who uh, is a big fan of uh, Marat. Marat. They, I guess it's pronounced Marat, right? And it, fact, well, we pronounce it Marat. <laughs> I, I pronounce it Marat because I can't say Marat. And in fact, that was his original name was Marat. I mean, right? M-A-R-A. -A. Yeah, I think it was uh, more French. Italian than French. A yes, right. He was born in Switzerland. Afshin Ratanzi, uh, who's the host of um, uh, Going Underground on uh, RT in London, uh, he's the only other person I know who's got a backdrop of Marat. Not only that, but the one by da da David. Is that by David, that painting? Uh, oh, no, I don't think so, no. The Death of Marat is by David, exactly. right, yes. Uh, that was, uh, one, one of the great paintings of the world in, in art history. I'm not an art historian, but I've read that art historians say that was a turning point in, uh, you know, in, in the art world. I saw, I, saw, I saw, I think, I don't know if it was a film or if it was a special on, uh, it was actually, maybe a little short drama about the making of the death of Marat uh, mm -hmm. by David. He also painted, uh, he also painted uh, Napoleon, right? The yeah. big painting he of Napoleon. One, one of the great painters of the age, and he happened to be uh, a huge supporter, political supporter of Marat. Another supporter of Marat was uh, Marquis de Sade. In fact, I think he gave the eulogy, uh, one of the eulogies, um, it's possible. Uh, I uh, am quite sure that they never met. Uh, you ask if Thomas Paine and Marat met. Yes, they did. Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> Thomas Paine was testifying against Marat at a trial of Marat. Oh, uh, wait a second. Really? Yeah. And he, he later, uh, uh, I think, re regretted that. And the reason he did that is because Payne, I, I think, was a great revolutionary. I agree with you 100%. But when he got to France, he came under the wing of the wrong people, namely the Girondins. Uh, you know, we think of the Jacobins and the Girondins. And as it worked out, the Jacobins were the, became the, the real radicals, and the Girondins became the moderates. And eventually, the Jacobins got rid of the Girondins. And then in the end, the, Giro, the remnants of the Girondins came back and got rid of, of uh, Robespierre. And that's and the, basically the Girondins came out on top, except for the ones that were executed earlier. Right. And Danton's one of them. Danton was very close with Marat. In fact, he hid him and he defended him uh, yeah. after that October, mid October uprising. Uh, he stood guard at his house and he castigated Lafayette and those guys saying, right. this, is a, this is up to our, our district here, the uh, Cordelier, how do you pronounce right. it? Cordelier. Cordelier Club. It's, it's, our, it's our district. They had like six districts there that they right. controlled. And he said, this is up to us. It's not in control of Mayor Bailey 
or anybody else. It's, in, it's under our control. So they backed down. The next day they came in, or late that night, they took his printing press, but he got away. He also watched them raid his house from across the street to a peephole. Yeah, right. That was interesting. He seemed to have a good sense of humor, a sense of irony, and a sense of uh, sarcasm. Uh, no, he, he actually uh, argued against uh, his friend, uh, Desmoulins. Yes. On the subject of, of humor, it's interesting. Uh, uh, Desmoulins said, uh, Marat, you're too serious. Uh, lighten up. And Marat said, even though he liked uh, Desmoulins, they were friends, he said, uh, Camille, don't tell me to lighten up. You don't want to make your readers laugh. You want to make them angry. And so Marat, whether he had a sense of humor or not, he didn't use it in his writings. He used bitter irony and he used bitter sarcasm, but he wanted to make his, his readers angry. Now, he didn't want to make them laugh. Whereas Camille Desmoulins wrote this hilarious stuff about the National Assembly's, Assembly's serious reports on the quality of the king's bowel movements because that was a medical issue. And it was hilarious. But Marat said, don't do that. <laughs> don't make him laugh, make him angry. Great story. Listen, we're gonna take a, a short break here. And we're talking uh, with Cliff Connor, the author of this wonderful book, uh, biography on, on Marat, Jean-Paul Marat. I'm gonna take a, uh, just a short musical break. We'll be right back in just 30 seconds. Assange Countdown to Freedom, episode 38 this year so far. And we are talking with Cliff Connor, uh, who joins us uh, from Manhattan. I'm somewhere out in the boondocks. Nobody knows, but there's a street next to me, and I'm staying away from certain people who'd like to uh, strangle me. Uh, and, you, you and Marat have that in common. <laughs> right, yes. I'm flitting around just like him. Um, Cliff Connor, the book is great. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, in the, when I first read it, it talked about his early days as a scientist and as a medical doctor, uh, physician. Uh, and uh, that's another thing where they try to debunk in the 50s uh, in this revisionism of his, right. his character, his uh, incitement of violence. You also say what the guy was a quack. And if he was a quack scientist, then his political ideas would be quackery too, and, and that and that's one of the themes that you point out at the beginning of this book. Exactly. Well, it turns out uh, when I looked into it, and by the way, my, my basic uh, metier is uh, not as a historian of the French Revolution, but as a historian of science. Right. That's how I got into it. I found out that Marat was a scientist. Who knew that? Hardly anybody. And I so did. I, I decided to investigate it. And I found out that he really uh, was quite a serious science, scientist for 20 years. Uh, as I said in the book, you read it first. Let me point out another thing. Uh, the new book that you put up on the screen, it's a, a small book. And I didn't put in all the stuff about his science and his uh, medical career. But I did put, a, uh, put all of that on a website. And in the book, it tells you how to access that. Uh, so anybody who gets the book can, can go to that website if they want to read about the science. But he was a legitimate scientist of the time. The reason that uh, the historians of science have tried uh, recently, 
with one great exception, uh, aside from myself, <laughs> uh, would, said he was a quack was because the great scientist of the era, uh, Lavoisier, called him a quack. Okay, so they just quote Lavoisier and say, well, if Lavoisier said he's a quack, he must be a quack. But it wasn't true. They also say that uh, the Jacobins, who were scientists like Marat, they, there's a famous quote where they say, this is after the, uh, the, the triumph of the radical part of the revolution, temporarily. They say, the Republic has no use of scientists. Well, that turns out to be apocryphal. That's not, that was never said. Uh, so Marat is accused of having uh, Lavoisier executed and of driving Condorcet, who was the head of the Academy of Sciences, to his death, which is absurd because Marat was killed before they were, by quite a while, so he couldn't have. Uh, but the question about him being a quack, uh, if you go to the website that I uh, was talking about that I set up called MaratScience.com, M-A-R-A-T science.com. Uh, I have all the documents there uh, uh, that, uh, that prove that he was a serious scientist, uh, taken seriously by lots and lots of people, although the heads of the Academy of Sciences, although they had treated him seriously at first, uh, <laughs> they got to hating him because he disagreed with Isaac Newton. And you can't disagree with Isaac Newton. I wouldn't. Uh, but <laughs> it turns out that as great as Newton was, Marat was actually right in his criticisms of him. And this, uh, I show this in there too. So Marat was not a quack. He wrote huge books on science that were translated into other languages. He was seriously considered to be the head of the Academy of Sciences of Spain. Uh, and, and on and on and on. He was a serious scientist. And all of these recent people who say, oh, well, Lavoisier said he was a quack, so he must be a quack. They're guilty of uh, making a conclusion without really looking at the evidence. I see. Well, uh, I'm, I'm convinced he was a scientist. I, I'm, I'm, I, I guess he studied in London. I mean, he spent time in London before the revolution. Uh, he was definitely influenced by Rousseau a lot, and he was uh, radicalized somewhat by him, but also by uh, the John Wilkes. And we talked about John Wilkes, how he influenced Payne in 1774. Before, absolutely, absolutely. When he came to this country, Payne, he actually witnessed, the. he was there at the St. George Massacre, and so was Marat. Marat apparently, was that can't be proven, but apparently he was. He says that he was there. Yeah. Now, I don't know well, if as a historian, I can't take his word for it, but uh, it, it certainly rings true. I, that's all I can say. Well, certainly he was influenced by the John Wilkes uh, movement uh, and, uh, for, for liberty. Oh, absolutely. He wrote a whole book uh, based on uh, the Wilkes ideology and took it even farther. Right. Chains of Slavery. Chains of Slavery, yes. Slavery. He so wrote he in English, by the way. His English was that good. Right, so that that's uh, one of his uh, first uh, pieces politically, right? And um, yeah. now he comes back, comes back after all of this time in Paris. I mean, in London, comes back to uh, Paris, spends time there, a lot of time there, and uh, gets involved in this through 1789. Goes back to London in 1790 for four or five months and writes from there. But he also like was operating like the Scarlet Pimpermill underground because he didn't trust there were too many spies, mm -hmm. the reactionary elements of the then French National Assembly, which controlled it, uh, and uh, the other uh, monarchy um, uh, elements uh, were definitely trying to hunt him down. That's how powerful his pen was. Yes, exactly. I couldn't agree more. The, um, the, the tell us about the support of the sans culettes of uh, sans culette uh, of uh, Marat. I mentioned the uh, the book by uh, Georges Lefebvre, which is anybody who wants to uh, learn. Well, I, I tell you, an easy way to learn the basic idea of what happened in the French Revolution, I would say, is to read that little book you you just got 
that I wrote, the small little biography of uh, Marat, because I, I try to lay that out in there. But where I got it from was from the, the works of a number of uh, French historians, uh, but uh, mainly Georges Lefebvre. And that's translated by R.R. R. Palmer into English as the coming of the French Revolution. That would be the main thing. He, he explains that the French Revolution wasn't just a matter of oppressed people against their oppressors because among the oppressed people, there were a number of different currents. There were people like Mirabeau who just wanted to get the uh, aristocrats out from underneath the, the monarchy and then to hell with the rest of the people, the hell the rest of the third estate. Uh, but there were most of the third estate, 25 million were peasants and uh, urban poor. And when we talk about the urban poor, that's what we're talking about. That's what was called the sans culotte which is what you just mentioned. They, especially in Paris, but in all of the cities of France, uh, there were urban poor that were uh, attracted to Marat's uh, ideas, but it was mainly Paris. Uh, so anyway, Georges Lefebvre said that the French Revolution consisted of four overlapping waves. First was the aristocratic rebellion. The aristocrats, didn't want to have to pay the taxes that you were talking about from the American Revolution. The France had, had uh, the royalty, the monarchy was trying to tax the aristocrats. So the aristocrats rose up in revolt, revolt, and the people followed them. They said, yeah, we're against the monarchy too. So they, they, got, uh, they got a constitutional monarchy on Bastille Day. So, it, it, but then later, people like Mirabeau and Lafayette that's, they wanted it to stop there. That was good enough. They didn't want to go further uh, to meet the demands of the sans culottes, the peasants, and so forth. So the second wave after the uh, ar aristocratic rebellion was the peasantry that lit the countryside afire, and uh, and they were in civil war all the way through through uh, to 1793, when finally the convention, when it was controlled by the radical Jacobins like Robespierre, finally passed the law that, that consolidated the revolution. And that was the law that said that the peasants have no obligations. Uh, before the aristocrats said, oh, we're going we're gonna to renounce our privileges. We're going to give up our privileges. We're going to free the peasantry. But that was the, empty talk, right? That was, huh? just, that was just empty talk. It like, was semi-empty. Uh, they did make the, pre uh, the peasants legally free, but they said, but you have to pay for it. It's as if the slaves were freed, but said, but you have to pay for your freedom. <laughs> and so uh, what happened was that's what the National Assembly, the moderate, moderate, moderate National Assembly supported by Mirabeau and Lafayette did. They said, yes, we're going to free the peasants, but they have to pay for it. And so the peasants went into debt to their former landowners, and they would have been in debt like the serfs in Russia. That's the kind of freedom they would have had, which is not freedom at all. And the peasants didn't buy it. They kept fighting until 1793 when the Jack radical Jacobins took power and they met that demand. And that was the, the most uh, important part, I believe, of the revolution that consolidated it and meant it couldn't go back to before. When the peasants were freed from their debts to the former land, landowners and were completely free. I find the French Revolution to be the most fascinating chapter <laughs> in, in human, at times. I've read everything on it. I read books uh, on, on uh, Robespierre, on Danton. I read uh, Hitler's biography on the French Revolution. I, the only one I haven't been able to finish because it's so long is uh, Thomas Carlyle's. Uh, well, French well, it's French not only long, it's kind of kind of hard to read because of the old fashioned you know, flowery language. You know, Dickens read it 10 times before he wrote uh, Tale of Two Cities. Did you know that? Dickens was a... Um, I can believe it. <laughs> Dickens loved that. Oh, he was, uh, he was a... He had to write it twice, by the way, because he was commissioned by um, John Stuart Mill. Uh -huh. uh, write the book, gave him all of his reference books. And so he, you know, said, all right. And he writes it and he gives the 
first copy was two thirds done to John Stuart Mill for safekeeping. And uh, lo and behold, his, um, his uh, house servant took it, mistook it for kindling and huh. put it into the fire. So he had to write it again from scratch. Oh, I, 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 book like I, that. Yeah. I had a hard time reading it. Uh, it's a three volume uh, history of the French Revolution, but it's interesting. It goes back to Louis the 14th and Louis the 15th, the first couple of chapters on Louis the 15th, what a scumbag he was. Um, so getting back to he, Marat, the subject here is John Paul Marat, Marat, however you pronounce it. And uh, here he is, he goes in the exile, he comes back, he has this big influence for the next couple of years uh, as things, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of divisions. I don't know if he stayed friends with these other writers like Herbert. Uh, or so, or um, or uh, Robespierre, who was a writer. These guys. Well, how many how many people, uh, you know, of these revolutionaries that were in the assembly or just kind of prominent figures ran their own printing press? Oh, a lot of them. And the reason for that is because up until Bastille Day, 17, 1789, uh, there was censorship, and uh, if you publish something, you had to publish it anonymously. Uh, and so, uh, but as soon as the, uh, after the great insurrection of July 14th, 1789, censorship was wiped out and they came out of the woodwork. There are hundreds of these radical journals and uh, a lot of them were very popular, but as it turned out, after a few months, it turned out that Marat's was the one getting the most notice, both from the sans culottes, the, uh, the urban poor who liked what he was saying, and because they liked what he was saying, he was seen as dangerous to the people who were running the, uh, the new revolutionary government, uh, namely the National Assembly leaders and so forth. And that's why they tried to shut Marat down. I, would, I did want to say one thing. He did have a lot of friends among these other journalists, especially Camille de Moulin. They were good friends. Yes. We talked about him. But there was one who was one of his fanatical followers uh, his name was Freron, F-R-E-R-O-N. He was a, a huge... I couldn't pronounce that name if I tried, all right? Freron. I, I, I know who he is, but I cannot pronounce I'm not even yeah. going to pretend that I can pronounce it, but thank you. Well, his uh, uh, development throughout the revolution, you, generally people uh, tended to be more conservative or more radical, and they'd go in that direction. He was a, uh, a, fl a flaming radical in support of Marat. But after Robespierre was killed, he became a flaming right-wing radical, just the worst of the worst. Uh, there were these gangs. Uh, you know, you, I think I heard you mention the Proud Boys uh, in something you wrote. Right. There were people like that that called themselves the, the Gilded Youth. And yeah. they were like the Proud Boys. And they were gangs that went around beating up uh, uh, you know, people like Marat, but Marat was already dead by then, but he, the, it was the gilded youth led by Ferron that uh, would bust up uh, statues of Marat everywhere. Wow. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, that's something that's like stormtroopers going in and breaking up uh, rallies uh, in 23 and 24 in Germany. I'm reading the rise and fall. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's very uh, much like that. And by okay. the way, the other one you mentioned was uh, Brissot. He's Brissot. Really an important uh, figure in this whole thing. Brissot was a huge supporter of Marat the scientist. Uh, and Brissot wrote books supporting Marat's science. Uh, right. and, and then at the beginning of the revolution, they were they were friendly, they were collaborators, but Brissot became the leader of the Girondin, which became the most conservative. Uh, well, it's tricky because for a while they went through this ultra radical thing where Marat had to say, no, no, you're not right about that. Uh, but that you, you'll see if you get into the book what that's about. But at the end, uh, the Girondin, which were led by Brissot, he was their major organizer. He organized that political party. Uh, they were the ones that had to be gotten rid of by the Jacobins in order for there to be any progress at the end that consolidated the revolution. 
We are talking with historian, also a historian on science. And uh, I know you got the book out, uh, the uh, something on, here it is. All right, I got it right here. I'm gonna get this book. That's oh, it, put a real picture up there. Uh, but- um, Right here. And you know, I wanted to read just the dedication. Oh, wait, you're gonna read that in a minute, all right? Okay. We're gonna read yeah. something because I, I, I got a little thread here. I wanted to, to parallels the persecution of, of Marat more than anybody else. Now, which was dangerous, the, yes. the concept of going after someone like him. Make those the, the analogy to Julian Assange for us. Okay. Uh, I, I think you've already done it quite well, uh, and especially in your series here, where you show that Assange is being persecuted because he's dangerous. His ideas are dangerous. The idea that we should, uh, we the people, should have the right to know what our leaders are doing, and uh, and so Assange's work through WikiLeaks was, uh, and then when Snowden came along and others that uh, blew the secrets uh, and told us things that we weren't supposed to know, they become the enemies of the people in charge, and they go after them by any kind of means necessary. Uh, with Assange, they're just trying to uh, drum up these uh, uh, things about him being a, a spy and a traitor and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it, it's bizarre. And anybody who knows anything about the the right of free speech knows that it's uh, a crock. The same thing happened to Marat. Uh, Marat was luckier until the very end when he was assassinated, of course. Uh, that he was able to stay a step ahead of them most of the time, but sometimes he had to go deep underground. Uh, as you say, you're not a, you don't feel like you're able to uh, live in your usual home. Well, he had to live in a different uh, supporter's house every night. Every night he had to change to keep ahead of the police. And uh, then he, he went to London, as you said, he had to, it, the heat came, it, it varied. And it, when the heat came down harder, he had to actually go into exile. Then he came back, started up his uh, thing again. Uh, and then a, a huge turning point was in uh, 1792, August 10th, where there was a, the second really great uh, insurrection of the French Revolution. And that did away, the first one brought about the constitutional monarchy. That was Bastille Day. But in August uh, 10th, uh, 1792, that was the second great insurrection uh, that brought about the Republic. The is that, is Republic. that when, when uh, Louis uh, escaped to Varan, when they- uh... Uh, No, that was earlier. And that was another thing that built Marat's uh, great prestige because Marat was predicting that and predicting it. And, and so many of the others were saying, oh no, he's not gonna do that. Uh, that was uh, late in 1791. The king and his household, uh, you know, I said earlier they had gone to Versailles, but that was public. This time in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning, he put himself and his family into a carriage and they took off for the border. And their purpose was to go to the Austrians and the, uh, uh, the monarchist troops that, were, that wanted to come to Paris, kill everybody in Paris that supported the revolution. And that's what Marat was saying. The king, you cannot trust him. He wants to escape. Keep an eye on him. And so <laughs> when that actually happened and the king uh, went, uh, Mar Marat became known as the prophet Marat. Uh, and that's when he really began to get his... Uh, uh, his he, also bust, he also busted a, a group of German soldiers pretending to be friends uh, early on in 1789 to be friends of the revolution. And that, they, that supposedly happened on, on Bastille Day. Again, uh, I think it's quite a credible story. Maybe not quite as important an event as Marat made it out to be, but the only... Uh, uh, account of it we have is Marat's own account. And as a historian, I, I can record that and say, this is how Marat said he spent the day on Bastille Day. But- uh, It was earlier in the day. So he was late to the party. And, yeah. and there was only like eight prisoners. They're all uh, there for, uh, or 11 maybe, uh, with letters of cachet. Right. 
right. Not a bunch of poor people. It was, it was mainly an arsenal. And what the, the reason the masses, the sans culottes, the, uh, the urban poor, uh, attacked the, uh, the, the old uh, prison was to get the guns out of there. And that's what they did. Wow. Well, listen, there's a, a lot more to talk about. We're probably going to have to do this again with you. But let's go ahead and um, before we go here, because we're running short on time, I want to talk about, uh, we're going to skip over, but uh, The Death of Marat by uh, Charlotte Corday. Uh, but first, though, Randy, could I take just 30 seconds to read yes. the dedication? Yes. yes, do that. That was actually... This is the dedication to the Tragedy of American Science, which is my new book by Haymarket Books. And the dedication is to you and others like you. Um, uh, it's, the dedication is to the investigative journalists, public interest advocates, public interest litigators, principled scientists, whistleblowers, and WikiLeakers who made this book possible. Well, that's great. I look forward to, to reading that and we can uh, have a nice conversation about it again, all right? Because we have a lot of shows to do. So, in, uh, um, go ahead. So, the day of his death, I think, was uh, in, in, in the summer of, uh, summer of uh, 1793. Uh, Correct. And, and it's back very, to the very special day, if you think about it. It was July 13th, which is the day before what? Right. Yes. For the celebration of Bastille Day. It was, so from Bastille Day, he lived exactly four years to the day. That's amazing. And so um, she get, goes in. There's a woman, she, uh, Charlotte Corday. He's, he's sick. He's got this skin condition. He's got a lot of problems. He's taking a bath. And uh, his wife doesn't want the woman to come up. And uh, he gets uh, wheedled into letting her up. Yes. And he tells a bunch of tales of woe that took place from where she was from. And uh, go ahead, finish the story. Well, everything he said is true. Uh, his wife, uh, who was uh, uh, Simone Evrard, uh, was kind of watching out for him because he was so sick. He was really, really ill. He'd had this problem for a while. And by the way, whenever you see a uh, depiction of Marat, like this one on my T-shirt, uh, was uh, he has this rag on his head. And some people think, oh, he's, uh, you know, that was supposed to look heroic and everything. No, that, he had that soaked in vinegar all the time. He wore it all the time, soaked in vinegar. So he didn't smell so good. But he had to do it because of this uh, horrendous skin disease he had. and and then. By the, time, by the time he was assassinated, he was spending all of his time in the, in the bathtub. And, and writing, he had, a, he had a block of wood, right? He was, he was still editing his, uh, his journal. And when he was assassinated, he was editing the, uh, the issue that would come out the next day. And it did come out the next day. That was the last one. So uh, he, he was uh, hardworking, but he was miserable physically because of this uh, terrible skin disease. Um, so anyway, uh, his wife uh, tells this woman, Charlotte Corday, uh, no, you can't come in. He can't see you. And uh, she says, well, please give him this note. Says, okay, I'll give him the note. So uh, Simone gives him the note, and Charlotte Corday claims to have inside information that he would want to know uh, about the Girondin, uh, which were the enemies right then of the revolution. And uh, so Marat was representing the, uh, the Jacobin Republic, which uh, had been formed recently. And uh, this woman wanted, was representing the Girons, and she wanted to assassinate him. So she pretended that she was going to give him information. And so he read the note, and he said, uh, Simone, yeah, let her in. Let me see her. I want to hear what she has to say. So the woman comes in and pulls out a dagger, stabbed him to death. Uh, all, a lot of people were there uh, and rushed in and grabbed her. And uh, somebody said, uh, uh, don't kill her, don't kill her. We want to find out who she's with, who she's from, who she's representing. And they did. And uh, about two days later, she was guillotined. But meanwhile, they had found out that she was a representative of the Girondists. 
And, and by the way, uh, there was an outpouring of uh, just massive love for Marat throughout Paris. And uh, it's amazing that a year later that could have been totally squelched uh, after the death of Robespierre. Uh, and then what became known as the legend noir, the black legend of Marat, made him out to be a monster. And that's what dominated historiography, historians, biographers, for the most part, for 100 years. Wow. Well, the name of the book is just Jean-Paul Marat. And it's written by Cliff Connor. It is. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, people can get that. Uh, look for it online. Get this book. It's, uh, it's a new edition. Uh, and um, I think you'll be uh, much smarter and much more aware of his monumental role in shaping the French Revolution and all of its aftermath. Thank you. And, and by the way, you tell the story quite well yourself, so <laughs> I'm glad to have contributed. I'm, I'm a dilettante, but you know, uh, but I'm, I'm a fan of, of the French Revolution. I'm not a historian. All right, uh, Cliff, uh, Cliff Connor, uh, I appreciate, uh, you know, uh, all of this time. We'll get back to your, we'll get back We'll get you back on. We can talk about uh, this uh, the new book on uh, science uh, that uh, you that's just out at Haymarket Square. What's the name of it again? The Tragedy of American Science. From and Truman to Trump. I can't remember. Were you showing a copy of that there? Do you have a copy? No, I do not have a copy. Oh, I'll, I'll ask Haymarket to send you one, and then all you'll... right, well, you'll do that. And in the meantime we have it posted right there in front of you. You can't see it because it goes on in editing. Oh, okay. All right, folks. All right. Um, I appreciate it once again, Cliff. We'll be in touch. My thank pleasure. You. Thank, thank you, you very much. And we'll do another version of uh, La Marseillaise uh, right now and be right back with some closing remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Assange Countdown to Freedom, episode 39. And we are looking for your support. This is a good time. If you like this show, if you would like us to continue, we do have bills here and uh, we are really running dry. Uh, go to Assange Countdown to Freedom.com and go to the menu and you'll see support and anything will help. If you like this program, if you think it's beneficial, uh, we think it is and that's why we continue to do it. Uh, nobody makes a salary here, just paying the regular bills. All right. Um, and what else can I tell you? I want to thank Kelly Lane, who's down there in North Carolina. And uh, I want to thank uh, Emily Kunstler. I want to thank Sarah Kunstler and Margaret Ratner Kunstler uh, for uh, chipping in and doing uh, the website and show description and ideas. Uh, and then, of course, Kelly does all of that hard editing down there in North Carolina as she engineers. So uh, give us some support here. That's AssangeCountdownToFreedom.com. And I think we're gonna go out 
here with uh, uh, another inspirational tune from, uh, this is the 19th century, and this will be uh, Va Pensero. And I don't know who it is, and I haven't decided who it is, because I get to leave now. We're gonna play Va Pensero, uh, written by Verdi in 1834, I believe. And it became the Risorgimento, um, Risorgimento uh, theme song, uh, the, uh, the liberation of Italy uh, back in the, everyone loved it. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of stories. I don't know if they're apocryphal or not, but people hit the streets, you know, trying to get rid of uh, the papal states and the Austrians and the French and unify it uh, with uh, Covur. Cavour, Cavour, and uh, Garibaldi was involved in that, and Rosini was involved in that, and others. And I'm going on too long. Folks, uh, enjoy. We'll see you next week. Slow.